crazy how a split second decision can change your life. My name's Dylan Ellis, sponsored kneeboarder from the Riverland and state and Australian go-kart title holder. Extremely high achiever in no matter what he did, so be it basketball, football, um, his motor racing, his kneeboards. Um, yeah, if, if he did it, he gave 110% or he didn't do it at all. Sport to me is a lifestyle. No matter what kind of sport it is, I try to evolve my life around it, enjoy it and embrace it. Ellis, your leader, as he was very early on last weekend. Dylan Ellis, who very rarely puts a wheel wrong. It's a good win to kick things off for your number 22 car, Dylan Ellis. I've always been a competitive person, never one to sit still. Dylan was very active from the age of five, even though he would participate and we were happy with just giving it a go. He was never happy with that. And no matter what he did, he succeeded at. So, and especially the journey from his accident, um, his determination, um, inspiration and dedication, um, it's just been overwhelming. And the respect he has from other people is just, it's just humbling, yeah, the pride that we have is just inconceivable. It was the end of year 12 and a group of us headed to school his festivities in Victor Harbour. The day of Dylan's accident, he texts me to say that he was about to leave Victor Harbour. He endeavoured to find a police car that had a breatho test because there was no way he would drive until he knew that he had a zero limit. We looked for a police car to get breatho to make sure we were zero. We weren't able to find a police car with a breatho in the vehicle. So we walked to the local police station and we got breatho. He rang me at 10.30 and said, I've blown zero, I'm on my way home, I'll drop Joel off and then I'm heading home. So I'm figuring sort of like the four hour mark I should hear from him, hopefully. Um, so about 2.30. So he got in the car and I had a late lunch that day. It was 2.30 and I hadn't heard anything. Um, and I thought, I'm not gonna ring him, not gonna text him because he'll be driving. And I went back into my office and at 2.33, I got a call from somebody who I still don't know who that was um, to say that he'd been involved in a serious car accident. Just four minutes away from home, I fell asleep behind the wheel of my vehicle and collided into the front of a B-double booth wine carrier. The surprising thing was how close I was to home when I had my accident. As soon as I heard the news, I just got my keys and left. I felt relatively collected, um, extremely worried, but I don't know, I just kind of had faith that everything was gonna be okay. Um, when I arrived and saw the car, I had second thoughts. I didn't ask too many questions. I don't know if I didn't want to know. But at the scene of the accident, um, we were given really no information at all. Um, Dylan was coming in and out of consciousness. Um, he was aware that I was there, but really not aware of what had happened at that stage. I was able to tell him that I loved him and I was proud of him. Um, that was the main thing that he knew that I was there. He has lost his memory from a month prior to the accident. Um, still doesn't have any recollection of the accident or prior to that. I've tried to be able to remember it and put the pieces together. Um, I'm not able to do that. I just think it's the body's way of telling me it's trying to heal and block, block that part of my life out so I can move on. The only thing he remembers is his near-death experience. Um, when not a religious family, um, my ch 
we were married in a church, the kids were baptised, christened. Um, but it's not something that they've ever followed. Um, but he said that when he, he didn't realise what was happening in his accident, but he knew he was trapped. Um, he said he didn't feel anything in the accident. Um, but he said there was a really bright light. Now this is 2.30 in the afternoon. It was one of those things that you kind of see on the movies and stuff like that, that people have to go through. I seen a bright white light getting brighter towards me. And my childhood as a young kid just flashed before my eyes. And then after it stopped that I, I said I didn't want to go. Achievements and parties and family holidays and just, just all his life literally flashed before him. He said the light got brighter and he actually realised um, he had that recollection that I'm going to die. He said that all he could remember is saying that I love too many people and I don't want to go and the light just went away as quick as it come. The light went away. On the day of my accident, I was airlifted to the Royal Adelaide Hospital where I'd spend two and a half weeks in intensive care unit and then the remainder of my six weeks in a spinal ward. Obviously it turned out well upside down. Um, the first four days we didn't know if he was even going to survive, nevertheless walk again. Um, in total he spent, in his time in town, about 40 hours on the operating table. Um, and each time, you know, we just kept on getting told we don't know, like, we have to do this. We don't know if he's going to make it, but you don't have a choice. He spent 12 days in ICU. On the fifth day, they started bringing him out of a coma. I remember blinking my eyes for the first time and getting a tube pulled out of my mouth that helped keep me alive for those first initial days. Obviously, the first thing on my mind was, was I ever going to walk again? I wasn't aware of my injuries or what sort of shape I was in. At that time, I couldn't feel from my waist down or move my legs. With his injuries, he had a bleed to the brain. Um, he broke his C6, his C7. He ruptured his spinal cord. He had interruption to his spinal signal. He collapsed his lung severely lacerated his liver. He tore his right thigh open um, and he broke the metatarsals and severed the tendon in his ankle and his left foot. The body has five litres of blood and he'd lost nearly four litres of blood by the time he got to Adelaide, so he was pretty critical. The doctors spoke to me about my injuries, what I'd sustained, and then with each day they spoke to me about how those injuries would affect me for days to come and the rest of my life. Um, being told that I wouldn't walk again was definitely the most daunting thing the doctors could have said to me, but it gave me the desire to prove them wrong. They said that it would be about two years before we knew where he would actually be at with his recovery. I started to get a bit more feeling back on my legs towards the end of my stay in the Royal Adelaide Hospital. I'd be able to feel a little bit more of my toes and they'd start to move. The movement was very minute, but it was something and it was a big positive step. We didn't know if it was going to be um, permanently in the wheelchair or if he would be walking again. On the 27th of December, um, he was moved to Hampstead. That was a bit of a, a rude shock on the first day. Hampstead Rehabilitation Centre really tests the person that you are. Um, it defines your beliefs about yourself. When I was there, they gave me a date that I'd approximately be there for six months. And um, I didn't, didn't want to be there for six months because it puts you through some pretty tough things. from that day that I said that I didn't want to be there that long. My, my goal expectancy time got dropped less and less. I went to five months to four months and my recovery time shocked them. They told us it would be six months 
before he'd be out of Hampstead. And he said, well, I'll do it in five. And then as he, he started getting feeling back in his leg, or first he moved his toes and then started getting some sensations. He said, I'll do it in four. <laughs> and then it was sort of like to three and he was out in two months. I think the overwhelming support we got Australia-wide through Dylan's connections with um, his go-karts and with his water sports opened our eyes to the respect um, and the support that he had, which at such a dark time was just so enlightening. The support through the Go-Kart Association, they decided to get um, a trust fund organised and everybody through meets donated part of their donations towards Dylan and we were able to buy a $2,000 gym so he could come home because he had to rehabilitate every day. Just huge. Um, we could never repay people for, for what that has, the difference that it made to our life and by Dylan being in his home environment, he just he just excelled so much faster. That really gave me the desire to push myself to get home and be thankful for what people had done for me. After my accident, my ultimate goal was to be able to get back onto the water, back racing go-karts, back to basically life before my accident, to the best of my abilities. I know there's people out there that have experienced what I've experienced and unfortunately they weren't as lucky as me. And that's really what's made me really appreciate the second chance I've been given in life and want to do the best that I can with that.